have your Bibles, let's open to the book of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 23. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. And our text simply says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal, eternal. I want you to notice the word eternal. How long is eternal? Long time. Amen. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Real quick, the wages. What are wages? Wages are payment. In other words, we receive a paycheck every week, and there are wages for the work that we have done the week before. And so this verse is saying that the wages or the payment for sin, notice the word sin, S-I-N, not sins, not sinning. See, a lot of you haven't gotten this yet. The reason the new birth is so powerful. In fact, the new birth is the greatest miracle that can ever take place. Now, we all like to see a crippled person get healed and walk straight. We love to see a blind person receive their sight. We love to see a, a deaf person receive their hearing. But the greatest miracle that can ever take place is a person becoming born again. Why? Because they pass from death into life. The payment for sin. That's referring to the sin nature is death. And it's not physical death. Hello? It's eternal separation from God. The payment for not choosing Jesus as your Lord and Savior is death. Eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life, everlasting life through Christ Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. And when we choose Him as our Lord and Savior, we then became partakers of of his divine nature. Amen? Now we all should understand that. We should all know that. But there's more than just getting saved. Part of our new church vision is reaching the unchurched. Say that with me. Reaching the unchurched. Or if you will, the unbelievers in our community, in our families. Amen? Tonight I want to give you a reason for reaching the unchurched. Probably the most powerful reason for wanting to reach the unchurched, the unsaved, the unbeliever. When I was growing up, in church, I used to hear this phrase quite often. We don't hear it much anymore. But the phrase that I used to, I grew up with was, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. The word shun means avoid at all costs. It's interesting that one of the doctrines of the church is about heaven and hell. And yet it's not preached on very much because it becomes offensive. It becomes a, an offense because 
in our modern society, we've become so humanistic that for a Christian to say someone might go to hell is no longer politically correct. Am I making sense? And yet the reality is there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. An honest study of Scripture reveals as much proof for heaven as for hell. The same logic which closes hell would have to negate heaven. Does that make sense? There are those who like to feel that beyond this world of sin and wickedness, there is a peaceful abode for all mankind. Any thought of a place of constant anguish and torment is undesired for those who hold only to the goodness of God. In fact, that becomes the argument. If God is love, then why would he send anybody to hell? If God is good, how could he ever sentence anyone to hell? And it's funny because those same people accept the reality of heaven but reject the certainty of hell. And yet in unmistakable language, the Bible declares the actuality of both places. And man can choose one or the other. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and again in chapter 30, God says, I set before you life and death. Now, he wasn't talking about natural life. They were already living. He was talking about the supernatural life. And death, he was not talking about when your heart stops beating. He was talking about separation from God. And so he said, choose life or choose death. You see, the choice is ours. I was talking to someone one day, and they said, well, what about the Muslims? I said, what about the Muslims? Well, that wouldn't be fair for God to send people who believe in Allah, a God, to hell because they're doing their very best to serve Allah. Listen, folks, God has a system that he works within. That's why the Great Commission is, go ye into all the world. Go ye into all the world. The problem is most Christians don't even want to go into their family. Most Christians don't even want to go into their neighborhood. Hello. But Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news of God's love. Why? Because in the good news should be news about God's love. And therefore, they would hear the good news, and the choice would then become theirs. Listen, God is not going to send the world to hell without first giving the world an opportunity to hear the good news. But not everybody who hears the good news accepts the good news. Are you hearing me? In fact, in the book of Acts, it says that God will not return, Jesus will not return until the whole world has heard the gospel. Now, I don't know about you all, but I would just assume, you know, with satellites and TBN and, right. and Daystar and everything, I would just assume that by now the world's covered. <laughs> so I have no problem when they say Jesus could come any minute. I, I would think so. But yet I was talking to a fellow who works for TBN, and he said, Joe, he said, 
there are parts of the world that have not heard the gospel. So when I hear them say, he's coming any day now, I go, not yet. It may look like things are lining up, but until the world has had an opportunity. See, there's where the goodness of God comes in. He didn't just say, you know what, one day I'm going to wake up and say, son, go bring the church home. He's not going to do that. Hello? Why? Because God, listen to me carefully now, God is not willing that any should perish. It's not God's will that any person would perish and go to hell. Are you hearing me? It's not his will. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, it says that God has predestined that the whole world be saved. Are you hearing me? He's provided a way for every human being to be saved. But the church has got to come to a point where it's willing to become what he's commanded us to be. He said, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. Notice, he said, you shall be witnesses. He didn't say you should go a witnessing. There's a difference. He said, you shall be. Can I tell you something? Everybody in this room that is born again is a witness. And again, you decide whether you're a good one or not so good one. Hello? You know, years ago when I started preaching faith, Somebody asked me, why are you preaching faith? I said, because someday you're going to have to live by faith. In fact, according to the Bible, we're supposed to live by faith right now. But the truth of the matter is, you've got to learn to live by faith. You've got to learn to exercise your faith and trust God. And, 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 and it's a growing, ongoing relationship. Are you hearing me? But what if the world got so bad that you'd have to believe God? for manna from heaven to eat each day. Are we growing in our trust and expectation of God's goodness and God's ability to take care of us even if there is no Dow tomorrow, no stock market, no economy, no buying or selling? I can't help but notice that the world knows something's happening. I was sitting watching the news today and a commercial came on and now they're starting to commercialize the fact that you can buy dry meals. They're encouraging people to buy buckets of dried meals. You know meals that all you got to do is add a little bit of water and a little bit of heat because there's... Even the world is anticipating the end. Are you hearing me? And God doesn't want us as his church to be in a position where we fear his coming, but that we anticipate his coming. The Bible declares there's both a heaven and a hell. And you and I choose where we will spend eternity. Our relationship with Jesus Christ determines our eternal destiny and abode. John 14 and verse 6 says, No man cometh to the Father but by me. 
So these two alternatives of Scripture must be faced. Let me quickly give you a definition of heaven. Heaven can be defined as a state of unbroken peace and unflawed joy in the presence of God for the redeemed. That's what heaven is. So what does the Bible say about heaven? What does the Bible teach us about heaven? That's what I want to deal with tonight. In John chapter 8 and verse 51, it says, most assuredly, I, I think the King James says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, that's what verily means. The new King James says, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. I'm going to be talking about death along with heaven a little bit tonight because uh, everybody wants to see Jesus. We used to sing a song in church, Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. But nobody wants to die. And yet, to get from here to heaven, unless you're translated like Enoch or Elijah, you have to die first to go to heaven. So we have to understand that just as the church has misused the word sin, sins and sinning, we've also misused the word death. Yes, there is a physical death, but there's also a spiritual death. Are you all with me? And Jesus said, if a man keeps my sayings, keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now that does not mean you won't die physically. But you won't just be dead and gone. Now I know this is going to be a little tacky tonight because none of us want to think about death. But the truth is we're all going to die at some place, at some time. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, that's physical death, he shall live. Now, how many know, let, let's just be honest, how many know that's hard, quite honestly, hard to do? Get your head wrapped around. It is for me because I've known people who have died. My mother died. My grandfather, my grandmother. The oldest grandson in our family died when I was in college. So I've seen family members come and go. But I was always able to rejoice even though there was... A, a, a period of grieving and sorrow and loss. I was able to go on because as a child I was taught many of the things that I'm going to be sharing with you and I understood though they were dead, yet they live. I don't know if you've been to an unbeliever's or a non-believer's funeral uh, or at a believer's funeral. Maybe some of you have never even been to a funeral, but I've been to non-believer's funerals and I've been to believer's funerals. And i got to tell you that non-believer's funerals are bad news. Because there's no rejoicing, unless, of course, they were in the will. But if they didn't get what they thought they should get, a war began. Well, I should have. Now I should have. I tell you what, death in family sometimes brings out the worst in people. Well, I want dad's watch. No, you don't get it. I get it. 
Well, then I want that. No, you don't get that either. And they fight about everything that's left over. Death can mess you up in a heartbeat. No pun intended. But the Bible says that when a believer dies, they go to be with the Lord. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. We're going to look at that in a little bit during this study. When we come together and a believer has died and gone to be with Jesus, we should be rejoicing. Now that doesn't mean that you don't love them and that you're not going to miss them, but we should know that though they die, yet they live. Am I making sense? And that's why Jesus said, therefore, comfort one another. See, as believers, we can come around a person who's lost a loved one and said, you know he's not dead. You know that's just his body. You know, sometimes we get so humanized that we don't understand the spiritual ramifications of someone dying they didn't wake up one day and say today I will die and leave everybody behind no death comes suddenly many times but as believers we should know that when a brother or sister in Christ passes away Though they are dead physically, yet they are alive. And so Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me. Notice it did not say, though he be perfect. I'm going to have to touch on this because the, the, the prerequisite for the life of God is simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, most sinners sin. And they sin because they have a sin nature. But when you become a born again, you get a new nature. You are born again and created in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, your spirit is like God's spirit because he places his spirit within your spirit. Are you hearing me? Which means then you can live righteous. You can live holy. Now I'm going to assume some of you know your Bible a little bit. Is that all right? You're not going to make me go back to A and, and work my way through the points. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God made you righteous. Jesus became your sin so that you could be made righteous. And the moment you made Jesus the Lord of your life, there was a divine exchange. He took your sin. He took your shame and gave you his life and his righteousness. But many of us were not young when we got saved. We may have already created and developed habits in our life dependencies, attitudes, stinking thinking. Now listen to me very carefully because a lot of that is in the soulish realm. The moment you get born again, God works a miracle. He takes you out of darkness and puts you in light. He takes you out of bitterness and gives you love. He gives you the ability through his spirit to act right, think right. That all takes place in the spirit. I was sharing, I think, Sunday or, no, I didn't preach. I haven't preached on a Sunday in a month. It had to have been last week, Wednesday, I guess. I was talking about a Steve Harvey program. A lady was on there. Yeah, and, and she was running her mouth how pure and holy and perfect she was. And yet the way she was treating her daughter, somebody needed to smack her down. And Steve Harvey did his best. But see, I could tell Steve Harvey didn't have a clue as to who he is in Christ Jesus. 
He may know he's saved, but he doesn't know much more than that. And can I tell you, most of the church doesn't know who they are in Christ Jesus. Because in many churches, they're not taught that you're a spirit. You possess a soul and you live in a body. You are a triune being. And the moment you get born again, you become holy and pure and righteous, just like God on the inside. But it takes time to renew your mind to who you are in Christ Jesus and begin acting who you are on the inside. And sometimes your biggest enemy is not the devil, it's your own flesh because you want to keep doing what you was doing. And unless you renew your mind, begin to change your thinking as to who you are and how to, you should really live and behave, you keep doing what you was doing. And the church for many years did not understand that. And so they watched people come in and walk the aisles and give their hearts to the Lord. But they walked out and lit up a cigarette or they went to a bar and got drunk and the church would stand back and say, I thought they got saved. They didn't get saved. Yes, they got saved, but it takes time to change. Instead of the church being loving and caring, we just judged everybody. Even though Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. Now you're all clapping. But one of the reasons you want to begin to live right is because you're going to heaven. And when you get there, things are going to be different than here. There's no Joe's Tavern in heaven. You ain't going to get wake up in heaven and say, you know what? I'm going to go tie one on. Because you ain't going to be physical anymore. You will be spirit and soul. Mm. That was all free. So two verses that we've looked at. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keeps my word, he shall never see death. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, there it is, shall never die. Even if you mess up. Hello. Hello. Now, I want you to understand that these scriptures do not mean that the believer will not pass through the experience that we all call death. I think I've made that point clear. We're all going to die. And yet, in reality, it is not death in the same sense. It is death to the unbeliever. (laughs) Because Jesus, and it was so funny, Uh, Two of the songs we sang tonight said this. Jesus has taken the sting out of death. Did you hear what I just said? In fact, according to the Bible, death for the believer is compared to going to sleep. When we are sleeping, the current of life does not cease but flows on. And yet there is a shutting out of all the senses of the world and time. So when the believer faces death, for the believer, there is still continued existence. Because the mind is active even though the body is dead. The words repose 
and awakening are used in the Bible referring to death and is defined as repose, is defined as we lose our hold on and forget the things of the world. How many of you have ever said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this. Yeah, when I get to heaven, I'm walking right up to Jesus and I'm going to say, yo, what about this? No, you ain't. When you get to heaven and you see Jesus, you're going to fall on your face and worship him. In fact, anything and everything about this world won't even come to your mind. Because the Bible says when we see him, we will be like him. You won't have to ask him nothing because you already have all the answers. So again, repose. We lose our hold on and forget the things of the world. The word awakening is defined we die bodily, but we will awake in the presence of Jesus himself. John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus said, Where I am, there also will be my servants. Where I am, there will also be my servants. You see, heaven, everybody say heaven. Let's think of a little song we used to teach our kids when they were, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. Oh, I want to be in that place. Heaven is a wonderful place. Cute little chorus. Heaven is an affirmed reward to the believer. And we shall forever be with our Lord. It's a promise for us all to hold on to. It's found in, let me give it to you, you can look at it, read it with me, in John 14. John 14, beginning in verse 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I don't know about you all, but that's a good place for praise. Hallelujah. You know, a few years back, I was sitting in my office on a Sunday morning, and uh, I had put on a lot of weight. And and, uh, as I got bigger physically, I didn't buy larger clothes. And so I had a shirt on. I, I, I was wearing a 15 and a half shirt and I should have probably had on a 16 and a half that's how big I had gotten I had gone from where I'm at right now to 200 pounds or 198 something like that and so I was carrying 50 pounds more but I didn't change my size of my shirts I I changed the waistband because I couldn't even button the pants anymore And, and I went from a 32 inch waist all the way to a 36 and so I'm sitting in my office one day I got I you know I I like to wear a suit on Sunday, and so I had my button fastened and a tie snugged up, and I'm sitting there waiting to come out to preach, and, and I had my head down like this, and, and uh, Pastor Bryant walked in, and he said, hey, Dad, you ready? And I said, looked up at him, and I went, I think I'm going to pass out. And at that, I just fell over. Well, they thought maybe I was having a heart attack, so they called the ambulance. Next thing I know, I'm in it. I'm at, I'm at Crystal Run, and, and they're running things. And they go, we think you had a heart attack. I said, I don't think I had a heart attack. Yeah, I think you had a heart attack. So for three days, they played with me and made me a pin cushion. Every 10 minutes, they were taking blood. I said, give me a break already. And, 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 and of course, I didn't have a heart attack, but it was then that I found out that I was quite obese. I could agree with that and found out I was a type 2 diabetic. But it wasn't the diabetes. It was... The doctor says, we can't figure out why you passed out. I said, I know, it was the pink shirt. (laughs) 
And the doctor looked at me, he went, what do you mean the pink shirt? I said, that shirt right there hanging in the closet. It was the shirt that did it. He said, what do you mean? And I told him, I said, what, do, what does that say I weighed? Oh, you weigh 198. I said, yeah, that's a 15 and a half neck. I should have a 16 and a half neck. That's a 15 and a half. It's an old shirt. It shrunk up. It choked me. It knocked me out. The doctor started laughing and wrote it on the church chart. See, I had my head down. I was reading my notes. I was going over my notes. I was getting ready to preach. But because I had my head down, the, the shirt just bit up in there and, and pulled off the blood flow. And, and <laughs> But I got to tell you something. From that day, I have never feared death again. Because one minute I'm looking at Pastor Bryant, the next minute I'm out. And nothing existed for the moments that I was unconscious. It was completely peaceful. Now, I, I'm not going to tell you I had a vision. The heavens opened and Jesus said, it's not your time. Go back. Go back. Can I tell you something? I'm very skeptical of those testimonies, quite honestly. I think they had a nice dream. I didn't have a dream. I was dark. It was peaceful. Then the next thing, I'm waking up and everybody's, ambulance is on the way and everybody's making a fuss. I was ready to preach. All they needed to do was give me a glass of water and I could have gone and, well, I don't know. I'd have to unbutton my shirt. <laughs> but I've never been afraid of death since because one minute you're here. Do you realize all of us in this room, we're only one heart beat away? And you shouldn't be fearful as a believer because you're here one second. And you're in the presence of the king the next. Oh. They could walk by your body and what they'll hear in the distance is a choir singing, Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. Or some of you will hear an updated choir singing, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. Isn't it interesting that the old church used to sing about heaven? Today, we, we, I do not talk about that. But heaven is a reward. Are you hearing me? So that begs the question, who goes to heaven? And the answer is very easy. Those who are born again. Because in John chapter 3, verse 15, it says that whosoever, whosoever, how many know that whosoever means whosoever? Anybody? You, me, anybody? Whosoever believeth in him, that is Jesus, shall not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life please hear me when i say when somebody calls on the name of jesus they are instantly translated out of darkness and into his kingdom of light they pass from death unto life for years we've made salvation difficult I remember one time hearing a preacher say now just come on up here if you've not made Jesus the Lord just come on up he might accept you I thought well, that's the dumbest preacher I've ever but that's the way they thought you know because if you walked out and lit up a cigarette you didn't get it well dear God they, they were having a nicotine fit before you gave the order call hello you see, we've always related certain behaviors as proof. But the proof is in the believing. People do not go to heaven simply because they live good lives. Are you hearing me? If you ask most people, if you were to go out and just walk up to somebody and say, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Most people say, yeah, I think so. 
And you can look at them and say, you think St. Peter would let you in the gates? Oh, yeah. Could you tell me why you think you're going to heaven? Well, I live by the golden rule. I did add to others as they do unto me. <laughs> they always quote it wrong. That's not the golden rule. The golden rule is you do unto them as you would have them do unto you. The world ain't even got it right. I do unto others as they've done unto me. I, I, I tried to be the best person I could. Being good don't get you to heaven. Man, I, I've met some sweet people in the natural, but they just could not accept Jesus. People do not go to heaven simply because they live good lives. But it is our relationship with Jesus Christ which determines our eternal destiny. John 3 and 36 says, He that believeth on the Son, he that believeth on the Son, he that believeth on the Son. John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you hearing me tonight? Salvation is not about smoking, drinking, cussing. It's about believing right. Yes. Hallelujah. And believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who goes to heaven. And can I take this just a step farther because we, we're a church. We're family church. We're a church. It's amazing that the church judges one another. Well, we go to family church. Where do you go? Well, I go to First Baptist. Oh, you're all going to hell. No, they ain't. They believe on Jesus. Where do you go? I go over to Lutheran church. Oh, you're going to hell. We've got to get away from that nonsense. Amen. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. We're family. Hang on, Protestants. Catholics believe on Jesus. Oh, but they didn't do it our way. They didn't raise their hand, walk the aisle, and confess. Well, what are you going to do with John, uh, Romans 10, 13? Just throw it out the window? They call on the name of Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody asked me one day, because I, 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 I preach every year. In fact, I'm doing two sessions this year at the pastor's conference in just two weeks. And, 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 and people always asking me questions about what I think. And that, I think we just need to shut up. And get back to the Bible. John 3.16 didn't have a PS. Romans 10.13 does not have a PS. What were those verses I just read? John 3.15 don't have a PS. John 3.36 doesn't have a PS. You're all looking at me strange. What's a PS? It's an additional comment, isn't it? When you write a letter, you finish, you go, P.S. It means, I forgot something, here it is. God didn't forget nothing when he inspired the word of God. Did you hear what I just said? He didn't say, 
whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, and P.S. You can no longer smoke, drunk, or cuss. <laughs> yeah, Pastor, but I've heard some Christians that really cuss up a storm. That's because they're immature. They're carnal. They're still living according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. And by the way, that's 99% of all of you. And on a bad day, me included. Oh, yeah, you needed to hear that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When one of you dear saints who knows so stinking much writes me an email and puts me in my place, I'll let you have it. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, Pastor, what's the real reason you turn in the church over to Pastor Mike? I've had it, I've had it up to here. <laughs> Listen, as long as we're on this earth, we're going to have to deal with this stuff called flesh. Are you hearing me? But here's the problem. There's too many Christians who'd rather follow the flesh instead of following the Spirit. And then turn around and say, well, this Bible stuff don't work. It works for those who work the Word. You've got to get serious. Notice it says, God is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently say, not casual inquirers. Pastor, how did you know to do this and that? I prayed about it. Well, I prayed. When? Oh, a few years ago. I was praying every day. Oh, you're not hearing what I'm saying. So who will go to heaven? Anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we don't need to complicate it any more than that. Yes, there are some people who are going to go to heaven and they're going to move into a mansion because they're laying up treasures in heaven by their good works. You say, what's good works? Producing fruit in their life. There are some of us, we're going to walk through the gate and he's going to say, see that little shack over there? That's yours. You're all laughing. I'm going to tell you what, if I get up there, there's a shack over there, I'm going to go, whoo, I made it, I made it, I made it. Because i got to be honest, growing up, I was, church had written me off. They said I was going to burn. But I'm so glad the word of God speaks louder than the voice of religious zealots. The word of God says if I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and I confess him as my Lord and Savior, I got a one-way ticket to heaven. You know when they start, you hear that music? That's saying, shut up, Pastor, you're done. But I'm almost done. Actually, I got three more pages. But we're, we're, we'll just take as long as we need to because I believe, I believe we're at a place where some of us need to understand some of these things because we've got a new residence coming. Everybody in this room has an address, right? Yeah. It's getting ready to change. Yeah. Who will go to heaven? How about those who were faithful? In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23, his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will now make you a ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I want you to know that Jesus is looking for people who will prove themselves faithful. Are you hearing me? Yes, he's excited when you call on his name and accept him as your Lord and Savior, but he likes it when you mean when you not only accept him, but say, Lord, is there something you'd like me to do? Is there something you want me to put my hand to? God is looking for people who will move from just being saved to living a sanctified life. Spirit-filled life. People, when they get a paycheck, say, Lord, First tenth is yours. I'm blessing you with my giving. I'm going to trust you that you're going to bless what I sow into the kingdom. God has promised that faithfulness will not go unnoticed, but your faithfulness will be rewarded. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. They got it up? Yep. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. I don't know about you all, but I don't just want to walk in. I don't want to stand in front of a table in heaven and register. When I walk through the gate, I want him to say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Step over there and get one of those crowns. I want to wear my crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who loved his appearing. He's talking about people looking for him, people seeking him. I don't know about you all. I'm already giving you two things that you, 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 you should be wanting to get in heaven. Everybody ought to be, you know, go get a book of houses and start looking for mansions. We used to sing an old song many years ago. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. Anybody remember that song? Come on, Ken, you remember, don't you? I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that great land where it'll never dry or go old. I go to prepare, prepare a place for you. When you study that out, it goes, it says, I go to prepare a dwelling place for you. So we got mansions that we can look forward to. We got crowns. And in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Oh, listen to this one. To him who overcomes. May I ask you a question? Who is he who overcomes? Who is he who overcomes? Oh, the answer is going to shock you because it, 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 it staples everything I've already said. In the epistles it says, who is he that overcomes the world? He that believes that Jesus is Lord is the overcomer. And so here it says, and to him who overcomes. If you're a believer, you've overcome. Amen. Are you overcomers? Yeah. Are you sure? Yes. Yeah. Well, get ready to shout. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Hallelujah. I, 
I thought by now some of you'd be a little more excited. I think I lost you when I said death. <laughs> Why are you sharing this, Pastor? Because there's more to life than this. There's more to life the God kind of life than this earth. Can I tell you something? God only asks us to do a few things faithfully. And yet our reward will be many things in return. You ain't seen nothing yet. I can't wait till next week. I'm going to tell you what's not going to be in heaven. Then I'm going to tell you what's in heaven. Last year, we noticed some cracks in the driveway. So we called the asphalt guy and we said, kind of give us an estimate what it would cost to fill the cracks, and recode it, and put the stripes back down. And the estimate came in at $50,000. That's five. And four zeros. If you notice, we haven't done it yet. Fifty thousand, dear God. Fifty thousand dollars. And then I was reminded, son, chill out. My streets are paved with gold. Hallelujah. I said, so just send me a couple pounds. I'm just going to highlight real quick because because I want to. In heaven, there'll be no more tears. You won't get up and feel sorry about something and it begin to eat at you and make you weep and cry. Every day you wake up with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, I just exaggerated that because you won't wake up every day because you won't need to sleep. There's no more weariness. No more battles with the flesh. Oh my God. every day in the presence of the Lord. I was talking to an unbeliever one day and I was telling him some of this stuff I'm sharing with you, just kind of witnessing to him. And he goes, God, I wish I could believe that. Can I tell you the world is waiting to hear so that they can receive it? Are you hearing me? I don't know if anybody's told you all yet, but some of you are going to become some real good soul winners. Get ready. Because when God changes the vision of a house, that says, I'm going to reach out and you're going to touch the unchurched. God is going to begin to rearrange people's lives and bring them into your life just so that you can just look over and share the good news. When it becomes the vision of the house, you don't have to work it up. You don't have to pray it up. It just begins to manifest. Family members will come to you and say, I've been watching you for years. I want to know the answer things will begin when you have prayed and said God open doors doors will begin to I prophesy this doors will begin to open automatically without trying without threatening without working it up to extend 
there'll be moments when you'll just simply bump into somebody just touch them and they'll feel the power of God hit them Some of you say, well, well I, don't, I don't know what to say. You won't have to say anything. Because you're about to become and be witnesses. You don't have to plan on going. Because God will bring them right to you. You simply have to be what he created you to be. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, he not a masatara mashandara moku. He not a masatara moku. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word tonight. And I don't know about anybody else, but I receive it. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, if there's anyone here tonight, the Holy Spirit's in this house. If there's anyone here tonight that's never made you the Lord of their life, Father, I pray that they'll respond in just a minute to a simple prayer and accept you into their heart and into their life. Father, you're not willing that any should perish but that all will meet Jesus and spend eternity in heaven. Church, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I do believe you are the Son of God, the Christ. You are Lord. I recognize it. I declare it. And I accept you into my heart, into my life, as my Lord and Savior. I receive your gift of life everlasting. And from this day forward, I'm a child of God. I am eternally saved. I possess eternal life. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. With heads bowed, eyes still closed. If you're here tonight and you prayed that for the very first time and you meant it with all your heart, just wave at me. Anybody at all? Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you back there. Hallelujah. God is good. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we gave each and every person in this room an opportunity to choose life. And I thank you for those three or four hands that went up and acknowledged that they accepted you as, your, their, you as their Lord and Savior. We bless them tonight. Hallelujah. We thank you for them tonight. And we thank you for your faithfulness. So I ask you now, look down from heaven. Bless this congregation. Lift your countenance upon them. Be gracious unto them. Smile upon them. And may we all sleep tonight with peace. Knowing that if our hearts stopped beating, we would spend eternity with you. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for destiny. We give you praise. We give you glory. And we give you honor. Jesus' name. Amen. Woo! Amen.